We need to rest. I hope you hear that. We need to rest. It would be a great disservice to our understanding of God's gift of Sabbath if we think of it only in terms of our American cultural tradition of not shopping on Sundays. Uh, blue laws banning shopping on, and leisure on Sundays and the prohibition on Sunday sale, liquor sales, we don't have to worry about that, but the, the prohibition on Sunday liquor sales are the simple, they are the visible indications of what I call an iconic faith. That is, these are the representations of Christian practice rather than an experience of faith. But God's gift and commandment to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy is supposed to be an experience, an experience. And therefore, it is an invitation and an exhortation to something more than just a symbol or representation. And see, it's more than a representation, it's more than a symbol and representation because it's, it just doesn't follow that God, in, in the moment of Israel's liberation from bondage, that God would offer this commandment solely for the purpose of restriction or solely for the purpose of a representation. Uh, no, 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 no. There is something else that I think God wants us to have. There's something else that God is giving us when God says, remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. For the people of Israel, this is going to be very important now. I, I want us to understand that for the people of Israel, life as slaves in Egypt meant that they got no rest. Their identities were as slaves, as chattel. They were objects of Pharaoh's project of empire building. They were the means of producing economic and military power for Pharaoh. Their very bodies were treated as commodities, pressed into endless work to satisfy the fears and desires of a tyrant. And no matter how much wealth and no matter how much military might Pharaoh had, he wanted and demanded more so that he could be the undisputed ruler of all rulers. And he needed a military to protect his, his status as the undisputed ruler. So there can be no rest. There can be no rest. He has to achieve, to accomplish, to perform to possess, which means there can be no rest for him, there can be no rest for his slaves, there can be no rest for Egypt. And the people were being choked to death in a vast machinery of production and violence. There was no time off, there was no organized resistance, there was no relief. And if they did not produce, if they did not work, they were deemed lazy and they were violently pushed to work harder and if they resisted even that, they were killed. But when God, when God delivered Israel from bondage, God made a covenant with them and bestowed upon them a new identity. They're not slaves. They're not objects, they're not commodities pressed into work. They will be God's treasured possession, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. They are no longer driven by the need to achieve, to accomplish, to perform, to possess. They are no longer enthralled to the drive for more. Even during, and this is how beautiful it is, even when, Jesus, when, even when God got them out of Egypt and put them in the wilderness, there was going to be like, we're in the wilderness, how are we going to live? How are we going to live in the wilderness? But even in the wilderness, the delivering God did not burden the people with hard labor so they could work for food and water. Uh-oh. Oh, there's oh, going to be some conservatives going to get mad at me. They didn't have to work for food. They didn't have to work for water. God just gave it to them. 
Oh, see, you, that's, even, that's strange to you, isn't it? They didn't even have to work for their food. God just gave them food, gave them water. And then, here's it, it, it gets even weirder. They're in the wilderness. They don't have to work for food and water. And then on the seventh day, God said rest and still gave them food and water. Unlike Pharaoh, God does not, does not press them endlessly into work with no rest, with no joy, with no, no expressions of, of delight. The people of Israel now, the people of Israel now can work to support themselves in their community, but on the Sabbath, they are to cease their work. They are to cease all of the striving and the, the production and delight with God in what God has done. Rest, rest, and be with the God who delivered them from bondage. Here's the thing, here's the thing. I want to be clear to you. We do not rest. We simply are a people who do not rest. We do not practice Sabbath. And here's the sad part about it all. We've taken on the identity. We've taken on every identity they've given us. We are all, every, everything we're known as. This is what we're known as. We're known as consumers. We're known as taxpayers. We're known as voters. We're known as middle class, uh, uh, working class, or poor. We're known by all these things. And then, not only are we known by this, then we begin to exist in our, all of our lives as these things. And the one thing that we do not live into is our identities as God's treasured possession. And so then we don't rest. We begin to live out what they say that we are. We begin to live as objects and commodities pressed into endless work to achieve, to accomplish, to perform, to possess. And that means that we do not rest. And here's the thing, we work so much, we work so much, and we place so much emphasis on work and on succeeding and on making it that we have even made church into, everything begins to mimic the economy, everything is commoditized, everything is for sale, we are for sale, everything is about pr the production, it never ceases. And all God has done is given us a gift to step out of it, to step out of being producers, to step out of being commodities and simply rest as God's beloved people, to be the treasured possession that God cares so deeply for. Oh, I've seen it. The church has gotten into the business of requiring endless work. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about volunteering. I'm talking about the endless work, the work to be perfect. The work to all these rules about how you need to show up, everything you need to do, you, you, every, everything is now a sin. You can't do anything. Every rule. You can't get to heaven if you, don't, if you sit next to a Muslim. You can't get to heaven if you, you know, all these rules. The church has now even begun to act like the economy, requiring stuff from us, re requiring us to do all these things. But you know, I heard it. I heard Jesus tell his disciples to stop working so much. Oh, you would say, well, pastor, where did he say that? I'll tell you where he said it. Jesus told his disciples, you cannot serve God and wealth. Oh, I'm about to get in trouble now. What he was saying was, if you are all about succeeding and getting and thriving and getting more and doing more, you ain't gonna have time for God. You can't serve wealth and God too. The great rabbi Abraham Heschel wisely asserted, the world has already been created and will survive without the help of humankind. So we can take some time out and delight with what God has already done. We can take some time out 
and refrain from work and trust God to do something. Because if we cannot trust God to provide for us in the wilderness, if we cannot trust God to treat us as what we truly are, what he said we were, the treasure position, then we're gonna live in a state of fear and anxiety all the time. We'll be preoccupied with having more, getting more, doing more, we won't be able to stop. And you know how I know because I used to do it. I used to do it. I used to do it all the time. And life was never satisfied, never said working out from six to sometimes two in the morning to get more, to have more, to be more successful, to get more money. I kept doing it, just wanted to, I had to, had to get more. There's no way out. And then God gave me a touch and said, you need to get off that merry-go-round and rest and delight in what we have already done. And here's what I want you to understand something, because if we're always, we're always working, if we're never resting, if we never put a stop to endless work and striving, we're going to be fearful and anxious people. And here's what fearful and anxious people do. Fearful and anxious people can't take, they, they won't be able to take care of the rest of those commandments. Fearful and anxious people, they tell a lot of lies. Fear and anxious people end up killing somebody. Fear and anxious people are, don't know how to be neighbors to people. Fear and anxious people scapegoat and attack immigrants. Fear and anxious people will tell you it's not enough money to pay, give people a living wage. Fear and anxious people say there's not enough of anything. In the wealthiest nation in the world, in the wealthiest nation in the history, fearful and anxious people have you believe we ain't got enough money to pay our bills. Oh, see, I'm getting in trouble. But no, you hear it every day. Fear and anxious people tell us we don't have enough money for anything. We can't take care of people who are poor. We can't take care of people who don't have jobs. We don't have enough of anything anymore. That, that's fear and anxiety speaking. And guess what? It comes from the very people who work endlessly and never stop and divest themselves of this machinery of economics that tears us down. Oh, I don't want to work in Pharaoh's land. I want to be free. But I heard Jesus say it. You cannot serve God and wealth. You can't do it. You cannot do it. Because if we serve wealth, if we live only as commodities, if we live only as workers pressed into service, we won't have time to be in covenant with the God who gave us our very freedom. But I want you to know something. I don't, don't go out here and tell someone, said, the pastor told me to quit my job. <laughs> That's not what I told you to do. But what I am telling see the provision of food and water, even some of it that you didn't even have to work for. And I also don't want you to think that I'm telling you that uh, pastor told me to rest so I can be refreshed, so I can do more work. That's not quite what I'm saying. I'm not saying rest on this day so I can do double work tomorrow. Nope, that, that, that's not what I'm saying. But what I want, I, I, I want us to understand something very, when I, I said earlier that Sabbath is an experience. It's an experience. And the invitation that God has given Israel, and I think God gives us every day, is to delight in what God is and is doing and what God has done. To look around and enjoy each other to re redefine ourselves from just being consumers and taxpayers and voters and be what we truly are deep down, the treasured possessions of a Sabbath-keeping God who wants us to delight in the beauty that God has created. That's who God wants. God, I, I think the invitation is to, to divest ourselves of a system that can't see us as a treasured possession. Step out of it for a little bit and, and just enjoy company with each other. To, to, to delight in one another, to laugh. 
laugh loudly, to be obnoxiously funny. Enjoy what God has given us. Have a good time. I tell you that some of the church folk are some of the meanest, ugliest people I've ever seen in my life. But enjoy what God, this is what I, I believe the invitation is, to relieve us from being a part of Pharaoh's machinery of production just for a while. To let it go and enjoy it. To free us to just be. Don't care about how you look. Don't care about what's going, just have a good time. And that's what I mean when I say we need to rest. I almost said, and the title of this, I want to say, give it a rest. But I said, that's too, yeah, you know. But, but rest. Enjoy what God has given us. We're still time to enjoy what God has created. This beautiful world that God has given us. And to do our part. To give it a rest for a bit. Stop producing and achieving and performing. And just love each other and love God and love what God has created. That's the invitation. I hope you take God up on it. Amen.